Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our course. This is the Transforming from Student to Clinician, the Fieldwork Experience. So if that's where you are wanting to be, you are in the correct place. My name is Becky Olson, and I'm an occupational therapist. I've been over 30 years as an occupational therapist in a variety of settings like hospitals, nursing homes, home health, but SNFs are pretty much my favorite. So that's where I have been for about 30 years. And I love students because it's awesome to see them blossom from, you know, I only am here because I had to take this field work to at the very end, I love this. And 30 years later, they're still in the same position. So. That says a lot for our professions. So I'm going to also introduce you, Amber Brockle. I, Amber, Amber is one that often I go to to help me with CFY supervision. She does it via telehealth or in person. So she is my go-to for that. So I thought she would be a, an excellent resource for us. I also have, uh, no, I'll let you introduce yourselves now. You're Amber, I'll let you go first and then I'll introduce Bren. Okay. Hi, I'm Amber, I'm a speech therapist. I've been a speech therapist for over 21 years and I currently work in the SNF setting, although I do do home health and outpatient. I did a little stint in early intervention and realized that SNF is kind of where I wanna be. Children just weren't for me. <laughs> But I love being a CFY supervisor, so I get to, um, you know, see them as kind of baby clinicians, and then they grow and they're ready to kind of fly on their own and do their own thing. So it's pretty rewarding. And we have Bryn Cronin. She is the queen of OT students, so she <laughs> takes a lot of students. She's from Washington area. So Bryn, I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Bryn. I've been an occupational therapist now for something over 10 years. Um, I can't keep track anymore after that. Um, I work in the nursing home outpatient and home health levels. I've also um, done some things with adult day center. Really older adults um, are my passion. I've um, never had the opportunity to work with kids and um i really enjoy just working with students um in this setting um to help them grow as as clinicians and learn to love the field and and love this population as much as i do thank you and john word pta uh, I asked John to be with us because he's had over 30 to 40 students, multiple, he's out of Texas, multiple students, and a great resource for me to go if I have any questions. So John, I'll let it, you introduce yourself. I got my introduction to physical therapy in the Air Force and uh, I worked in a variety of settings. I really liked, I'm in an acute care and long-term uh, um, care unit. I really like working with the uh, dementia patients. They're some of my favorites. Um, and I love students because I like to, see, like to see them, how they learn from beginning to end when they interact with patients and do treatments correctly and uh, provide optimal care. It's fun to see the light bulbs go on. It is. <laughs> All right. So this course, let me tell you a little bit about this one hour course, what it entails, is going to be a panel discussion. This is for PTs, PTA, OT, OTAs, speech students. It's for both the clinician and for the student that is about to take a field work. It is for all the above. So uh, some of the objectives that we will go over in this one hour is number one, we're gonna talk about um, how to prepare both the therapy clinician and the therapy student about expectations of the fieldwork experience. 
gets kind of frightening. So we want you to know what to expect. Secondly, we're going to educate the therapy clinician of regulations and procedures during the fieldwork experience. Number three, we're going to provide resources for both a the therapy student and the therapy clinician. We have some links attached. Also, we are going to identify the rewards for both the student and the clinician. So uh, it's, it's a win-win situation for us to help our profession as well as help therapy students. So with that, we're gonna slide right into our panel discussion. And so John, I have my very first question for you. John, who can become a student supervisor? So you have to have one year's experience in the field, be licensed, and uh, usually your your supervisor wants to see how well you're doing before he he uh, approves. For that. We're we're losing you there a little so bit. So one one year one year's experience as a clinician is required and uh our supervisor wanted to see how we did for a year before he put us in the position as an instructor okay amber do we need to have a contract between the school and the facility yes you do you need to have a contract in place before you can accept the student typically the rehab company will reach out to facilitate the contract between the facility and the school and a contract does need to be signed before you can take the student. Okay. Brand, what are the different levels? You're an OT, so what are the different levels of supervision for an OT? So this, this actually applies to both OT and um, occupational therapy assistant um, disciplines. Um, for There's a level one and a level two. For the level ones, that's really more of um, like a part-time uh, affiliation where they're really observing. Um, they might work a little bit with me for direct, um, indirect supervision, but really they're just there to learn what the field is, what the profession is in the setting. Um, for level two, that's where we're getting more hands-on. Um, that's more of like a, an eight to 12 week um, full-time there every day as compared to the, the level ones, which is tends to be like a two to three week, um, depending on the school program that they're from. Um, at a level two, we're really looking at the the goal of the affiliation being that the the student is going to become an entry-level clinician at the end of it so really full scope of practice everything that an entry-level clinician would be able to do thank you john i'm going to ask you the same question you're a pta what are the different levels of supervision as a pta or our first the first level is usually four weeks for two times a week, and it's just basically observation for them. The second level is three weeks every day, and they're kind of limited in what they can do, but they bring a checklist to let us know what we're, what they can do, and that's what we grade them on. And the third level is five, six weeks uh, every day, and they can do all scopes of practice. Okay. Same question for you, Amber, your speech. Mm -hmm. So, what are the different levels of supervision for speech? For speech therapy in for graduate school students, you really have three different practicums, and there's not really different levels. When I went to school, I just had two practicums, and I started out um, co-treating with the speech therapist, and then as my skills grew, I was able to treat on my own. So speech therapy is a little different than OT and PT. And then we also have a CFY requirement. So after the speech, after you've graduated from grad school, you need to participate in a 36 week, about nine month long CFY program, clinical fellowship year. 
and that's separated into three different sections or segments. Each segment is 12 weeks long. And your supervisor needs to supervise you for um, six direct hours of supervision and six indirect hours per segment, which ends up being about 18 hours of direct supervision and then 18 hours of indirect supervision. And you can have some of that supervision be telesupervision, but at least three hours need to be direct supervision. And because of, I've never had to do indirect supervision, and I mean, I've never had to do telehealth prior to COVID, but I have had to do some telehealth supervision with my CFYs because of COVID. Either I was unable to enter the, um, their facility due to COVID restrictions or I had COVID in mind. So um, that makes it a little more convenient. You can do some of telesupervision. More convenient. John, this question is for you and Amber. So I'll start with you, John. What will a student and the therapist need to know prior to day one? Um, we need to let them know uh, what to wear, uh, what the uniform will be, the name tag, the hours they'll be here, the facility address and the phone numbers they can reach us at, uh, COVID vaccination or exemption status, reviews the current uh, COVID restrictions. Thank goodness we don't have any right now. Uh, assignments are required. Uh, now college provides that. And the common assessments prior to review, where you can come in the building and uh, make sure the vaccination, vaccination is taken care of beforehand and uh, the TB test is done as well. And usually the Manto or the TB test is done prior to them even coming, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Amber, any anything different for speech? Not for speech students, but if you're a CFY, you are hired on by the company. So you need to make sure you're clear through the facilities HR as of your start date. And it's a little more in depth. You might need a drug test depending on the company's requirements. Okay, John, this question's for you. How do I know what is expected from the college? We have a good relationship with the colleges we, we work with, and they send me the information on the student before they get here. And they also send a, a one sends me a book on it with a checklist, and the other one you know, uses the APT CPI uh, grading system. So I know uh, what I need to work on with the student while they're here for that level. So you're out of Texas. So Brian, you're out of Washington. How about for you? What is expected from, do you know what is expected from the college? And that's a great question, Becky. It really depends on the college is what I've um, come to find in my years of taking students. Um, some schools will send a document that they really, especially for the level twos at, at what stage um, or what week, sorry, of their affiliation, um, are they expected to see X number of patients, what percentage of the caseload, um, when should they be independent with their documentation or what level of supervision should they be um, needing. Um, you're, we're also looking at sometimes there are some expectations from the schools that the students will uh, do a project or um, some sort of paper or, or something depending on what the school's uh, what the school is set up to do um, and I usually have my students do some sort of project regardless of the school school's requirements so um, I'll review that before the student comes and then I'm feeling prepared and know how what, how I need to guide the student. Are there any, uh, you, you mentioned projects, are there any specific kind of projects that you've had your students work on? Yeah, you know, I've, um, uh, for my, my OTA students, the assistants, I usually have them create some sort of treatment um, tool or, or um, like a treatment experience uh, that we can use with a, uh, for our, our patients in this setting. Um, we've had students make a pipe tree or create some sort of um, 
fine motor vest so that patients can practice different kind of fastenings, different kind of closures. Um, more recently, I had a student create uh, a, a laundry activity with a movable um, clothes hanging device so that patients can work on their functional reaching, can work on their balance, um, and something that was really portable, which has been really important since COVID because sometimes if our facility is in, in lockdown, if we have COVID cases in the building, um, we have multiple floors and we can't have the patients who are in the, the COVID area come down to our treatment gym. So have it something that we can pick up and then take somewhere and sterile or sanitize has been really helpful. Um, gives us a lot more options other than just patients in their room touching the mirror. <laughs> Speaking of prefer? COVID, <laughs> John, uh, how has COVID affected the student field works? Well, early on, our facility wouldn't allow us to have uh, students for the first part of COVID. And when we finally did, uh, we had a few students, but not, not very many. Uh, it just, it, really limited number as soon as we, we were able to, to help. Brian, how about you? Have you noticed a difference? Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think a lot of students noticed at the beginning of COVID that there weren't a lot of affiliations open to them. Um, and we, especially at the beginning, um, when there was the PPE shortage, we really had to limit um, students. We weren't allowed to have any here. And fortunately, that's opened back up again recently. Mm -hmm. um, on the other side of things, I've had a student as recently as this year who had her affiliation from last year um, shifted. The time was shifted. So all of her classmates were in school, were in their, their affiliation back in the fall and she basically didn't have class or or an affiliation she said she just worked for a few months um and so when she had her affiliation here when she was doing her schooling with me she didn't have her classmates to collaborate with or to problem solve through so she really felt like she was on her own going through everything and trying to figure things out on her own um, and of course, you know, I, I helped her as best I can, but part of the learning experience is getting together with your classmates who are struggling and comparing your struggles, comparing your experiences. So she really struggled there with that piece. Um, I've also had more difficulty when those affiliations are delayed getting information from the schools. Um, such as, I know a student's coming, but when exactly are they coming? Um, what's the student's name? When can I expect them? Um, and that back and forth uh, is a bit of a struggle. Um, I know that the schools are doing the best they can. And, um, you know, similarly, we as clinicians are doing the best we can, but I don't think we've quite ironed out all the bugs there. Um, hopefully with, in general, knock on wood, things opening up again, we're gonna have a little bit less of the um, uncertainty that comes with normal life, I suppose. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> John, do you feel like it's getting back to normal since COVID with your it's students? It's starting to. We, we've been without masks now for about a month. We no longer take temperature checks. Uh, okay. It's starting to return to normal. Okay, that's that's good. So we talked earlier about what would prior to day one be like. So now let's talk about day one. So what, uh, Brian, what would day one look like for your, uh, for both the student and the clinician? What takes place day one? So day one um, is really kind of the orientation day for me. Um, I'll show them the building. We have a quite a large facility here, as you know, Becky. Um, we have an outpatient facility. We have 
um, a large campus here with a dementia care unit and um, subacute unit and long-term care unit. And um, so I'll show them, you know, some of the basics that people need to know where are the emergency exits, where are the emergency procedures, um, what do you do if there's a fire or um, an active shooter, all those things that, you know, you have to know. Um, introduce them to the relevant staff here, the, the nurses, the nursing aides they're going to be working with, the other therapy team members, um, the administrators, just so that they know who's this new person walking through the building. <laughs> um, treating people, um, show them to our therapy gyms, uh, show them the equipment that they'll need, be needing to, to use, um, where are the tools they'll need, Where's the, where are the goniometers, where are the dynamometers. Um, and then we start to go into some of what their expectations are um, or what my expectations are of them. Um, Going again over some of the stuff that John was talking about earlier, like the dress code, the hours, making sure that our phone numbers for each other are um, are finalized, that I can get a hold of them in an emergency or they can get a hold of me if they're ill or not able to come in. Um, we'll talk about what the documentation looks like here, what the computer system looks like here. Um, stuff orientation stuff like when do patients eat here when is when do we eat here um what we talk about kind of the students comfort level doing things what are they what do they feel like they need to work on what do they feel comfortable with um i usually like to do what i call pop quizzes which is not as scary as it sounds, I don't think. <laughs> it does sound um, scary. <laughs> well, I'll usually ask the patient you know, or ask the, the student, you know, pop quiz, what are the what are the bones in your elbow? What's that look like? Or pop quiz, what's this tool called? It's a dynamometer. Pop quiz, you know, what what are we looking for um, when somebody's had a stroke? What would we be assessing? Um, and that's more really to test the student's knowledge so that I know where they are as a clinician and I know where how how we need to be focusing our attention and our teaching, um, not really as a grading strategy, more just as a how where do we need to go with this? So for instance, my last student that I had here, even though it was her second level two affiliation, so she should have been, it was her last thing she had to do to graduate. It should have been something where she really came with most of the skills. Um, she didn't, she never learned how to transfer patients. Um, she hadn't had that since her, her school taught her that about a year prior. Um, and that was something that she really needed to work on. So we spent a lot of time going through different transfer, transfer strategies, body mechanics, um, tools available. And by the end, she was, she was a pro, but that's how we knew how to focus our time and how to focus our attention. She had a lot of other skills that she brought, but we had to focus on that piece instead. John, how about you? Is that very similar to what your day one is like? Ours, it varies. It depends on our patient load. If our patient load is lower, I have more time doing orientation. If it's higher, then uh, the orientation may be a little shorter. Um, and But usually the first day I have them, when we go to patients, watch what's going on, see how we introduce themselves to patients, uh, see how to approach patients. And with the Alzheimer's patients, sometimes they get to see uh, the best the best way to approach patients sometimes is to come back later. <laughs> that time may not be good for them. But um, now I ask them some questions and things to find out where they are strong at and where they're not as strong. And I try to focus whatever weakness they have. I try to put that, you know, train them on that so they can uh, be ready to get out in the field when they are. 
Okay. All right, uh, let's see. Next question, I'll ask each one of you, but we'll start with Amber. Do I have to be directly in line of sight of my supervisor or my student? If it's a student, it depends on the payer. If you're in direct line of sight, skill like Medicare A, HMO, managed care, you don't have to be in line of sight, but Med Bs you do. As a CFY, they are working under their own interim permit. So I they don't need to be, I don't need to be in direct line of sight. I just need to observe, you know, the recommended hours over each segment. Okay. John, how about you? Do you I'm have to direct be directly in line of sight as a PTA? Uh, yes. For our PTA students, I am. Okay. Bryn, anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think Amber really covered that um, pretty well. Uh, again, for the the Med A or Med A like payers, um, once we've assessed the student's um, competency, um, once I feel comfortable with the student treating the patients um, and knowing when to go get help, knowing when they're in over their heads, um, they're able to transition off of line of sight. But um, with the Med B or the Med B-like pairs, it needs to continue to be line of sight. Um, this is true in the, the outpatient and the, the home health settings as well. We really need to continue with line of sight in both of those. Um, but I, I think there's also some local guidelines that you might need to check. Um, to this is this state is how it is yeah mm -hmm. in the state of washington i i think it can change in different places so you know okay. <laughs> so I, i'll ask uh, each of you um as a student we always learn we always are fearful of failing you're not being able to perform so have you had a student that was struggling and what did you do let's see i'll ask john i'll start with you have you had a student that was struggling yes i had one that was very timid uh she was, she knew what was you know what to do and she was knowledgeable of the information but she had a really hard time uh dealing with patients early on she was very very too timid and uh, i tried to say you don't have to be loud or so much of an extrovert but you got to be a little bit of an extrovert just to get across to them who you are and um what you need you know how what the plan for them to get better is and how they can cooperate and make a team with the patient and uh, we let the school know and we kind of put her in situations where she had to become less timid and she came around it, it took a little more work for her though for that Brian, how about you have you had had to fail anyone or had someone that struggled? Well, yes, I have had someone who who struggled. Um, that was a tough situation. I think a lot of it was similar to, to the situation John was describing where the student just didn't come with the confidence um, or the necessarily the people skills um, that she needed. Um, ultimately, I, I contacted the school once it became available or once it became obvious that it wasn't the normal, um, just early into the, the, the clinician jitters or the, once it, once it became obvious that we needed more than just time, um, that it wasn't something that a little hand holding or a little confidence building was really going to make a difference with. Um, so I talked to the school fairly early on, probably about week two or week three, and mentioned that she was struggling. And they came back and said, yeah, we had some concerns about this student um, as well. And so they worked with her a little bit, too, on some different strategies. Ultimately, the students did not fail. Um, our, my goal is never to have a student finish uh, an internship 
that they're not going to succeed at. Um, my goal is always to have the students be successful. And if it becomes obvious that it's a situation where the student cannot become successful, um, there's really not a point in my mind to them to them finishing it. That's not a learning experience that builds the student's confidence, that, that builds their skills, that's going to contribute to them um, becoming an entry-level clinician. Um, so the student and I kind of ultimately decided that she had the she had a lot of the underlying skills, but this was not the right setting for her. So we I didn't want her to to fail just because the setting itself was not the right setting for her. But it's a tough decision, you know, you really have to we think about it, we we love our students, we bleed for them. <laughs> yes, I remember one that didn't do well and we had them extend an extra field work um, just because we felt the extra experience was needed. So I think we would all agree that we do everything we can to make them the best. Amber, how about you? Have you had any issues with your CFY supervision and what did you do? Well, um, I had one student, she was over in Eastern Washington, I'm located in Western Washington. So she kind of struggled that I wasn't available in person as much as she needed. And she was also a little bit older, this was her second career. So she just lacked the confidence. So I, she needed just a little more, you know, handholding, a little more check-ins and reviewing some courses. So she ultimately did go on to get her C's, but she just took her longer and um, just need a little more, little more in-person time. And that's something that you can, it's a minimum requirements for a CFY. There's a minimum of, you know, the 18 hours over the whole entire nine months, but that's just a minimum. Some of them need more. Some of them just need different direction, different cues, or maybe even bringing in, I had another speech therapist who was more into the trakes and vents that I asked her to help too. So you can pull other people in too to give them a little extra boost. So it just took a little bit longer and a little more um, handholding. So I think sometimes what trips people up is mm -hmm. that you learn in the classroom and you learn um, on your fellow students um, who are typically able-bodied people. Um, and then you get into the real life setting and it's, far more complicated. People have multiple diagnoses. Um, there's doctors coming in and interrupting your sessions. There's nursing coming in to interrupt your treatment sessions. And um, that sometimes can be a bit of a tripping hazard maybe mm -hmm. for, for students. So it's tough. Absolutely. All right, John. This question is for you. Can I have two students at the same time? Yes, ma'am, sure can. And uh, how does that work? Uh, it works fairly well. You, you can also have, usually when you have two students, you somehow they have different strengths and weaknesses, and you can have one help the other with a weakness that they have and back and back and forth. And you can also, uh, while you're working with one, showing them how to do something, have the other observe. So you can, it really is, it's, it's, it works out pretty good. And then when you get into later in stage, you have one treat, one patient while you're, and you're working with, with that student while the other one watches or doing a note from, from the other one they saw. But it's good to have different, you know, different, they both see things different ways most of the time so they can help each other out. I would think that would be collaborative for them. That would be good, I would think. Yes, Amber, how about uh, Sue FY supervision? Can you have more than one at the same there's time? No, there's no limit on how many CFYs you can supervise. I think the most I've had at any given time was five. Um, it's just, actually it's nice to have more because sometimes I'll pull them in and have like a little collaborative group where they can you know, bounce ideas off of each other and so they feel like they're asking a peer 
but there's no limitations. And then I have an old area vice president, I think back in Minnesota, where she was the CFY mentor for the whole area. So she just did all the CFYs. So there's no limit. Sometimes it gets a little, a little crazy. You'd have to travel. Like I had a couple in Eastern Washington, but I mean, keeps it it's spicy. Keeps it you know, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about documentation next. Um, how do we work that? So, uh, Am Brian, I'm going to ask you, uh, how does the student complete the documentation if we're on an electronic system? Well, for for my level one students, I usually have them just do a, a soap note outside of their observation hours. Um, I think that's good practice for them. I think that gives them the opportunity to practice documentation um, outside of the classroom setting on a on a real patient. Um, but I don't use any of their documentation that they that they create as part of their chart. I do all the documentation with a level one student. For the level two student, um, the goal is for them to become an entry-level clinician and uh, that is all the fun of documentation <laughs> with it unfortunately um fortunately unfortunately um so usually we start by having them observe me writing the notes um and them doing a couple notes on their own um either typing it up on their own computer and submitting it to me or um, writing it out longhand and submitting it to me just so I can see what they're picking up but again as a teaching learning tool um, as the affiliation continues I have them start typing the notes up while I observe or having them write the notes and then I go and read it afterwards and clarify is this really what you mean is did you forget something um, this part's looking really good I like how you're changing your your verbiage there i like how you you're describing what the patient's reaction was um learning unfortunately the computer system can be a bit of a, a process but that's part of the reality of therapy in this mm -hmm. setting is you have to be able to document what you did um if you want to if you want to get paid you got to document what you did so we have to have to practice all the bits and pieces so john uh, as a pta how do you how do you have the students do documentation i usually have them write a note in a soap format and um most of them tend to write books instead of uh concise notes so we work on getting uh, for the information is still there but it's in a more concise format and uh, i used to write reports for doctors and First one I sent in was like three pages long, and I got a phone call back. Said, "Can you just give me a couple of paragraphs?" So I try to get that to the documentation. You don't have, you don't want to spend an hour on a document for a 30-minute treatment, you know. But you want to get what you need to get in the notes. So we go over that. How to say certain things more concise, and that's just an ever. Everybody can improve their documentation. It's continuing even after you, you're a full clinician. You're still working on your documentation still as still am mm -hmm. yes, art. Uh, Amber, how, how about you for speech um for a student like bryn said i have them start um doing you know, the soap note or an oprah note depending on where you work uh, outside of like not on the computer and then you know, transition them to the computer which is with me checking because yeah like john said they tend to write a novel and no one wants to read that. No one is going to read that. So just kind of like, you know, working on getting more concise in the skilled treatment that you did. Uh, as a CFY supervisor, especially when I had five CFYs, I had to make sure I was getting all their hours tracked, both indirect and direct. ASHA has a template I use. It's the template for tracking supervisory activities. That was really helpful. That way we know we we're on track and getting everything done. You can get that from the ASHA website. All right. Uh, one of the things that I often hear from therapists is I don't want to take students because it affects my productivity. So 
John, I'm going to ask you, well, having a student, does it affect your productivity as far maybe as labor when, management and PCT, patient care time? Maybe when they first get there, when the orientation is, is doing, when you're doing some reviews with them every so often. But uh, from a day-to-day -day basis with the, with the note writing and actually doing patient care, if, if you got two especially, it really doesn't affect your productivity. How about you, Bryn? I I'd agree with John. Um, I when you, they first get their feet under them, um, when they're still learning where the building is, where you're when you're having to figure out what the teaching opportunities really are for that student, um, it can slow things down a little bit. But after the first week or two um, for the level twos, they should be much more um, independent and more able to take on some of those job requirements. So a lot of the time I'll, um, because as we all know, documentation can be the slowest part sometimes, um, I'll have them write their note while I'm treating a patient and then we'll switch and I'll have them treat the next patient so that we can we can alternate and kind of build up their tolerance so eventually they're writing notes more quickly they're taking over a little bit more um, of the the job requirements um, i can review things that they've done um, while they're treating while i'm uh, um, supervising them treating so um, by the end, usually it's it's pretty good. Okay, all right. Now, when you do a field work, do you get CEUs for that, John? Um, as a clinician um, or a clinical instructor, I do not, unless the patient, or unless the students are from Texas, a Texas school. If they're from Oklahoma okay. school, and I, I don't. Okay, so it's very state specific then. Yes, How about you, uh, Bran? You're in Washington. Yeah, as of as of now, I've gotten CEUs for all students that I've supervised. Um, for the the level one students, it's typically you get one CEU for that level of supervision, and um, you really haven't provided, generally speaking, more than. 10, 20, 20 hours of them observing you, following you around. So it's it's really not a um, not a heavy burden outside of the time they're there. Um, for the level twos, you get one CEU per week of supervision. Um, there are limitations that for how many CEUs um, you can use, how many hours of student supervision you can use as part of your um, CEU requirements for licensure or um, AOTA, um, but I don't remember what those are specifically off the top of my head. Um, you may need to check with your local state um, guidelines in order to in every state for state licensure. Yeah, I think that varies. Mm -hmm. Amber, do you get any um, CEUs for your CFY supervisories? No, no? I don't. Okay. All right. Last question. Um, what we'll do is we'll we'll open it up for questions shortly after this. But um, so hang on to your questions. So here's here's my last question to all three of you. So John, I'll start with you. What are the rewards that you get from having a student? Well, it really. Uh... You get to see some new things they bring in from from school. That, you know, I've been been in PT for a long time, and it's been a while back since I went to school. So I get to learn a few of the new things, like some of the new terminology. Even mm -hmm. uh, the other benefit is um, I get to teach them. You know, and we could, and if they're a really good student and they're from, they want to be in the area I'm in, then we might have a good employee. After they get, you know, get a degree, get their license. You can pick uh, and choose who you hire, right? You can. That way, you can build a team that's got some that fits together well and uh, is well balanced. Yes.
Brian, what are rewards do you get from having a student? Well, um, I I think they bring a lot of new energy to the the table, and they bring a lot of like John was saying, new assessments and things like that. I had a student, for for example, who brought um, something called the kettle test to my attention, which is a functional cognitive assessment wherein you have you ask your patient to make you a cup of tea and to make one for themselves. And then you see how they figure out how to follow the instructions, um, how they problem solve, how to plug in the kettle, things like that. Um, and just very interesting, something I hadn't really heard of or known anything about. And the, the student brought the assessments to me, brought me the information, set it up so that we could use it. And we had a functional cognitive assessment that was another, another option, another tool for us. Um, as I said earlier, my students always do some sort of project and whether that's a presentation, um, a case study, or uh, creating a, a tool for us to use here, um, we get some opportunities to learn. We get some new fun things to use in the clinic. The student gets to be proud that they're leaving something behind. Um, and on top of all that, it's fun. You know, teaching is fun. We get into the therapy world because we want to see people get better. We want to see people grow and learn. And um, I think having a student kind of like that too, where we, we get to help shape another clinician and share our passion and our love of the field of what we do with them and um, get to show them the, the wonderful world of geriatrics. <laughs> Amber, you're next. What kind of rewards do you get from supervising students or well, CFI supervision, I should say? Yeah, I graduated 21 years ago. And so getting students and CFYs, they just bring in new information, new knowledge, new research, new terms. I remember a CFY said something to me and I had to Google it. I'm like, what is she talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love the Google, right? <laughs> the Google and that we survived without it. But they just like, you know, infuse new energy, new, just re renews the, my, my love for geriatrics and for speech therapy that, you know, sometimes we just get stuck in the day to day. And so having a new student with fresh eyes is great. I'm also a director of rehab. And so um, we just, I, we hired here in this facility two of our students that we just recently had because they were, they were great. I know how they work. I know how they work as a team and with the patients. So as a director of rehab, students are a great resource for employment because you can get them, you can train them and they, they're like the perfect clinician and you know what they're like. So. And then That's once true. they come in, they can really hit the ground running mm -hmm. because they've had their orientation yeah. already. Yep. They know. That's true. Both people, one. No, just kidding. They already know your documentation, their, <laughs> your patients, everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Amber. Thank you, Bryn. Thank you, John. We are going to open it up for some questions. However, before I open it up for questions, there's a couple of reminders that I want to share with all of you that are listening in. Number one, if you have someone else with you, could you please write their name in the chat box? so that we can send the certificate to you. So make sure your name and your email address is on in the chat box. Number two, I want to remind you all that the certificates will be emailed to you automatically and they will be coming uh, in your email one to two weeks from now. So this course content is one hour long so it's worth one CEU and we are now going to open it up for questions so Shyla I will let you open it up 
Okay, so far there um, there weren't any questions. There was just a comment. It said, in California, the limit is no more than three CF students per supervisor. And then um, yes. now there is another, it says, I help out at the local community college PTA program, mainly in the skills lab. What skill or knowledge base are you seeing that needs to be improved on? Oh, that is a really good question. So, uh, John, what are your thoughts there with the PTA? Have you noticed anything or any improvements that you you would see that would need to be in the PTA program? Well, the two that I, I deal with most, you know, I get most of my students from, do a very good job on the basics. Um, they come pretty well prepared. So I just have to find do fine tuning. I don't have to really strengthen, you know, hugely strengthen an area mostly. Um, they're doing a good. They're doing a really good job. That's good to know. Bryn or Amber, anything else you notice? I would say this from the students that I get. Um, what I would like to see a little bit more in is transfers. Um, body mechanics we provide um varying amounts of assistance as we all know here and um just the student having that good strong basis of good body mechanics um being able to protect themselves so that they'll have a good long career um and not just rely on that youthful strength um <laughs> that goes away sadly for many of us <laughs> That that would be really important to me. Um, that's something that certainly we can teach here in this setting, but if we have to spend a lot of time teaching it, that's that's when I start to get worried about productivity and things like that. Um, you know, one thing just from my own observation is insurances are a real bugger now. So I don't know if you're finding out that your students are you have enough they have enough knowledge about different insurances what what anyone have thoughts about that well and even what kind of services an insurance would cover um what kind of assistive devices insurances would cover that's that is a great point becky um and that's something that i as a clinician don't think i really understood the full grasp mm -hmm. of how complicated it really was um, until i was out in the field so having a little bit more background in a school or in a school setting would be highly beneficial you know we all want to get paid at the end of the day as much mm -hmm. as we do this for love we need mm -hmm. we need to pay the bills yes all right thank you shyla is there any other questions um what is the most important thing that you would tell a SPTA like myself who is about to start their first clinical rotation? Treat your patients like they're your family. Oh, yes. So in other words, are you saying that they really don't need to prepare or study that kind of thing? It's more of just having the right mind and the right attitude? If they've got the, the the knowledge base down, the biggest thing of our job is it, we're, we got to be people person. You know, you can't uh, all the knowledge in the world is if you can't get it across to the patient, and you're not a good people person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It's not not as important as you know, it's important to know things. You know, academically, but you've got to get it across to your patients. And you've got to have a lot of compassion. And sometimes you you may have to find a different way to to tell them, uh, but you treat them like you know, you're a team with them because you're we're working together for the same for the same goal. It's not you and against the patient. The patient is you. It's you and the patient as a team. And you have to establish that rapport, and they have to trust you. And once they trust you, whatever program you you put out for them and show them that they're to to benefit them. They'll be much more likely to uh, to cooperate with you. I like 
recommend, like any recommendations family. for working with students suffering from anxiety themselves? Uh, I think what I always come down to is you got to fake it till you can make it. Um, anxiety, you know, I think I think a lot of us operate on a low level of anxiety kind of with everything. Um, and when your patients pick up on that anxiety, that's when they get more anxious and they get less trustful and it's harder to build that rapport that John was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so figuring out how to kind of center yourself and how to present a um, more confident front even when you're just hiding it all behind mm -hmm. the face um that's yeah, part of yeah <laughs> don't let them see you sweat exactly mm -hmm. um that's that's just part of being a clinician some days um i'll look over uh patient's charts before going in and i'll think oh this person has been through a lot. They've been in the hospital for a few mm -hmm. months. They've had multiple surgeries, multiple injuries, illnesses. Um, how am I going to help them get back to, to their prior level? I just have to go in there and make the patient feel like I'm going to get them there. I'm going to be part of their team, part of their, regardless of how much inside I'm thinking, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> this is a big elephant and I don't know where to take the first bite. Well, you know, if you had a student that said, you know, I'm feeling really anxious about these things. I'm not quite sure what to do. Would that be something that you <laughs> would appreciate? It's honest. I mean, they're honest to, with you. And because uh, um, a lot of times I go into patients, I see, see the patient, and like, like Brenda says, it's just you, you're not quite sure exactly what to do. But you know, you know, there's things you've got to get better for them. So you, you try to find where can I make a, a good impact where they can see something positive today. And then I can work on some other things a little, little later on in more detail. Because I want to give them a positive. Uh, a positive okay. view when I leave the first treatment with them. And I always love it. Oh, oh, sorry, John. And a lot of times the first treatment is a lot about establishing rapport and trust. And you may not get a lot done that day as far as your objectives are. Mm -hmm. But once you establish that trust where they trust you and they know what, you, what your, your plan is for them and they know that you're going to help them, then the next time you're going to get a lot more out of the, of the session and it'll, it'll help you in the long run. And, and just what I want to add to that is I don't want my students to feel like they can't come to me and tell me when they're feeling anxious, um, because I can certainly help them problem solve some of the practicalities of it. But yeah, like when you're with the patients, that's when you have to try to be projecting that confidence, projecting that cool, um, and, and getting that buy-in and that trust. Um, with me tell me how you're feeling tell your ci how you're mm -hmm. feeling um because they can help you figure out if um there's a that's a skill you need to build on if that's something where maybe you could do a little research or a little reading outside of class or a little practicing outside mm -hmm. of um of your clinical time um or if it's something that you really just kind of have to do it. Mm -hmm. There's really no getting around doing it. Post pandemic, is there anything you're noticing about students' soft skills? Soft skills? Soft, soft skills. skills? Clinical soft skills, is that what the question is? Yes. I'm not quite sure what I... Oh. Is she she just said she said people skills oh people skills oh okay got you I let's see noticed a difference in like people skills i do know that i had one ot as this again it's 
not a speech student, but as a DOR, there was an occupational therapist that came out of school during COVID and she didn't have any clinical experience. So she, she struggled a lot. So, but nothing post COVID about people skills. I haven't noticed COVID making a difference in people skills with students any more than people skills with non-students. <laughs> that makes sense. Same As an experience. Oh, sorry. sorry, Don. Um, let's see. As an academic fieldwork coordinator, how do we go about setting up a fieldwork agreement with Aegis Therapies? Who do we reach out to? Did you see my people wandering on down here? Did you? No. Uh, I would say um, there. Reach out to your area vice president with Aegis. There is uh, a school field work supervisor that we work with, and we they set up all the contracts. So we will help them uh, get the get a contract set up with them. They'll reach out to the school and get it set up. So your area vice president. We'll help you. Okay, and that is our last question. Oh, here's one more. If you if you already had your CFY passed the national exam and completed your program, your MS and PhD, but you didn't apply for it. And it's been a while since you graduated. You didn't want to go through CFY and the test again. Is there a way to get it by applying now? I think there might be a, like a statute of limitations. I think you might have four years. I don't know. I would check on the ASHA website because honestly, I've never come across a situation like that. But definitely check the ASHA website. All right, it's the top of the hour. Just a reminder, if you are sharing a screen with someone, please make sure you write in the chat box your name so that you get credit and your certificates will be mailed to your email address in one to two weeks. So thank you all. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Bryn. Thank you, John, and thank you, Shyla, for being uh, behind the scenes and helping us getting it coordinated. Thank you all. I appreciate your work. Guys, one more thing. Um, yes. your ASHA, the ASHA bubble sheets are in the handout section. Um, if you are wanting a CEU through ASHA, you'll need to download that, fill it out, and send it to me. My, my email is Shyla, S-H-Y-L-A, dot hamrick h-a-m-r-i-c-k at aegistherapies.com okay That's all thank you shyla okay thank you guys bye. Thank, thank you bye-bye